Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm also here to give a very small plug for the Heart Valve Society. So this is a, um, a new society that has uh, been put together from the Society for Heart Valve Disease, which is now defunct, and the Heart Valve Soci Society in Amer of America, which, run the, which ran the valves in the Big Apple series for many years. So I'm on the board of directors of the Heart Valve Society. We would like to see the society grow. And the society is considered a heart team. So it has surgeons, cardiologists, and basic scientists. So the, the basic science is what I'm going to be talking to you today about. And this clicker works? Great. So um, I th when I think about how to study the basic science of heart valves, I think about the fact that they are extremely mechanically active. I would claim that they're the most mechanically active tissues in the human body. So um, and in order to withstand all of this complex uh, mechanics, it's a very complicated structure. So as you know, the mitral valve has a complicated structure of the two differently shaped leaflets and the chordae tendinae coming down off the underside. And then um, when you look at the internal structure as well, it's a layered structure where this is a stain that stains the different colors of the extracellular matrix, like collagen yellow, um, glycosaminoglycans are blue, and then there's a, an elastic layer on the other side that is black. So this matrix is it's a complicated layered structure, and the matrix is largely segregated. And also the hemodynamics that cross the valve as well are very, uh, are very complex. So um, this is an engineering marvel. A little bit more about the microstructure. So um, for the aortic valve, we call the top layer the fibrosa. So this is collagen rich. Collagen helps bear the pressure load. Um, it's very strong. Um, on the bottom side, which is the ventricularis, the elastin helps stretch out the, um, um, the valve so it can stretch out and cover the valve orifice, but then pull the valve back to a, an open position when the pressure load is gone. That's a, an elastomeric property. And then in the middle is the layer called the spongiosa. The glycosaminoglycans are very spongy, and they help lubricate the sliding of these two outer layers and kind of buffer all the repeated closing of the valve. And then, of course, on the inside, we have cells. We call them the valvular interstitial cells, interstitial meaning inside. And then on the surface, there are valve endothelial cells. So these are distinct cell types. Um, they're a little unique from other types of uh, cells that you would find in the body, and this is what my lab studies. So again, just to reiterate, the inner layer is largely collagen-rich, provides load-bearing. Collagen is a protein. It's the most abundant fibrous protein um, produced in our body, and it's present um, at the light microscopy level in a crimped form, and that allows it to stretch a lot before it, it stiffens up. Um, elastin is a stretchy molecule that um, is believed to be in a rather random coil orientation when it's at rest, and then or organizes into a, a more of a lined molecule um, when it is stretched. And then um, entropy, the laws of entropy, will require that it goes back to an unstretched state. And then um, in the middle layer, the glycosaminoglycans. Now, people are generally not familiar with glycosaminoglycans, um, so just a little bit about them. They are carbohydrate structures instead of proteins, so they're not gene products. And um, glycosaminoglycans are repeating structures of disaccharides, long repeats of disaccharides that may be decorated in the case of chondroitin sulfate, dermatan sulfate, heparin sulfate, um, or undecorated in the case of hyaluronan. And um, more people know about them these days because you can actually take dietary supplements of hyaluronan or glucosamine and chondroitin. So like my parents actually know what I'm talking about now. All right. Um, proteoglycans are glycosaminoglycan chains attached to a core protein. Um, this is an example of agarcan, which is the big proteoglycan found in your cartilage, and its spongy nature helps keep cartilage really compressible. Proteoglycans are everywhere. There's a lot of different kinds of them, and um, many of them are located in the extracellular matrix, so that's what I study. There's also a lot at the cell surface where they help in signaling. And um, let's see, and just the, the different types of proteoglycans may vary in terms of um, their overall size. This is a very small proteoglycan called decorin. This is a very, very large one called versican. Both of these are in heart valves. And um, in particular, I study the chondroitin and dermatan sulfate proteoglycans 
Decorin and Biglycan, which help organize collagen fibril formation. They're kind of like a behind the scenes organizer. And Versican, which helps with the compression. Okay, so one of the reasons that these layers are so important um, mechanically is that they are um, in the, so this is a, um, a kind of an illustrated cross section of a leaflet in the resting state with the valve open. And then when pressure is applied, this, this leaflet will, um, will pull out and or get pushed out towards the center of the valve orifice. And as it does so, the collagen fibers stretch out, the elastic fibers stretch out, and then with the removal of the pressure load, it will kind of, un, um, everything will return to their, um, the molecular resting state and, the, uh, and, and allow the leaflet to be pulled back to normal, to the normal open position. Okay, the way we find out about the mechanical behavior um, that this extracellular matrix gives rise to is through mechanical testing. And so we can cut little strips of heart valves and clamp it between these, um, these grips right here and then pull on it. So one side stays anchored and the other side moves up and down. And we generate what's called a stress strain curve. So we can see that valves are originally very stretchy. With very, with very little stress, they can strain a lot. And then at some point, the collagen is unfolded and it stiffens up, and then we can get what we call the elastic modulus or stiffness. So we normally measure like the extensibility, how far the valve stretches until it stiffens up, and then the elastic modulus of how much, how stiff it gets. Okay, so valves are what we call anisotropic. They are stiffer in one direction than the other. They're stiffer in the circumferential direction. So this is a picture just from a mitral valve, but orientation works similar in the aortic valve. The circumferential direction is around the circumference, and the radial direction is from the annulus to the free edge. Um, we also test the mechanical properties of chordae quite a bit, but here I'm gonna show you the leaflets. And the different layers, it turns out, have different mechanical properties. So um, if you look in the circumferential direction, um, or for the fibrosa or the ventricularis, the two outer layers, you can see that they're both quite stiff, um, but not very extensible. Um, oh, sorry, this was the fibrosa here. But then the ventricularis for the, um, in the circumferential direction is quite stiff, but the ventricularis in the radial direction is very, very stretchy. So we can deduce from this the way collagen fibers are, are arranged and um, try and figure out how the valve would behave mechanically when we put these layers back together. Um, heart valves don't have one set of mechanical properties, okay? The layers behave differently, but age is also important. So if we look at the stiffness or elastic modulus um, as a function of age, just in, in the circumferential direction, it's stiffer than in the radial direction, but with every increase in age, whoops, with every increase in age, there is an, um, an increase in stiffness. No matter whether you're looking at the aortic valve, the free edge of the mitral valve, the center of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which tends to be stiffer, or in the radial direction, the aortic versus mitral valve, there's an increase in stiffness with age. So we measured this on three age groups of pigs, not people here. This is a six-week-old pig, like a, a suckling pig is analogous to a pediatric child. Six-month-old pig is a young adult pig, and a six-year-old pig is about as old as they get in Texas, and they are a, uh, you know, an, an older individual, perhaps representing what you would have in your patients. Okay, just a tiny bit now, how biomechanics are influenced by mechanobiology, or and how biomechanics differ from mechanobiology. So biomechanics is what I've just talked to you about. It's how the tissue behaves in terms of what happens when the valve is opening and closing, and its mechanical properties. But mechanobiology is actually a living subject here. Mechanobiology is how mechanical stimulation, and of course, so this could be mechanical stimulation from the valve opening and closing, or how just the heterogeneous environment of the, of the valve with its different layers and different extracellular matrix mechanically affects cells. So the cells then, are, as a result of the stimulation or different environment, are gonna behave differently. But also the cells can mechanically affect tissue. So valve, valve cells, some of them can contract. This has just a minor effect on the valve tissue mechanics, but we can, we, I'll, I lump that into mechanobiology. So just a couple of examples of this. 
Um, we have been looking at the second case here, the, the effect of the cells on the environment. So one of the things that we do is look to see how heart valve cells will contract collagen, solutions of collagen and turn them into a little tissue. So um, we generally look at, um, so this is just soluble collagen that is um, soluble in an acid state. If you neutralize it and add cells, then the cells will mix with the collagen, start to anchor to the collagen molecules, and contract it into a little tissue that you can touch, and it's kind of sli slimy. Um, but you can actually mechanically test it as well. So we look to see whether how the cells are um, affected by anchoring conditions, whether they're free to contract, the gels are free to contract, or whether we anchor them here, like between little posts, which allows tension to develop. Sometimes we actively stretch them using just special computer-controlled systems. Um, so we can control the magnitude of stretch or frequency. And then um, we can control extracellular matrix by adding to the collagen different, uh, like elastin or different types of collagen or glycosaminoglycans. And then in this study here, we can regulate the cell metabolism. So by changing the amount of glucose in the culture medium, um, this is one gram per liter, two grams per liter, or 4.5 grams per liter of glucose in the culture medium, we were able to control just how the cells were met metabolically able to contract the collagen gel and affect their environment. So um, there are other ways of mechanically stimulating cells. Um, some people will take intact valve tissues and um, and get the cells to contract in them by giving them vasoactive uh, uh, agents. Um, that can be done in animals, it can be done in vitro. Um, it's, very, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, provocative area of research. Um, for more control of this, we have what we call the Rice University flow loop system, or ruffles, and this is a way that we mechanically stimulate cells that are actually within heart valves. So these are valves that we get from pigs, and, um, and we can sew them within an attachment here and then um, kind of clamp it within a mock cleft ventricle and then um, have the valve open and close. And we can subject it to different um, uh, conditions of where we precisely position the papillary muscles so that we can um, induce regurgitation. So mainly we're, we're studying how mitral valves in this living model um, how the cells will remodel the tissue as a function of our mechanical environment. And so in a collaboration with Steve Little, we've developed models of mitral valve prolapse and functional mitral regurgitation that, are, that manifest uh, measurable changes in the tissue after just a week um, of culture. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, this flow loop <laughs> is, a, uh, is a, um, a system where we have culture medium that comes uh, down from a medium reservoir um, through, the, uh, through the mitral valve, gets pumped up back into a compliance chamber, and then recirculates back to the, uh, the medium reservoir. And then um, we also are um, trying to stimulate the way valve cells behave when we grow them on structures of different stiffness. So instead of growing cells on tissue culture plastic, we grow them on little gels that have different stiffnesses. They're quite soft, for example, between three to 20 kilodaltons. And we found that, um, and then we can coat them, these, these polymer gels with different ligands representing different extracellular matrix components such as laminin or fibronectin. And this is an example of valve endothelial cells and how they, um, how they produce both um, um, von Willebrand factor and the, and the enzyme that degrades von Willebrand factor, um, ADAMTS13, uh, um, when we have them on these different combination hydrogels. So lastly, then, normal heart valves have fascinating biomechanics because they have a complex structure, and this allows the valve to work. Diseased heart valves really have altered mechanical behavior, but so, of course, do aged heart valves. So it's worth studying how their um, altered mechanics um, arise due to the different extracellular matrix. Um, mechanobiology of valves is a, is a very young field, and people are studying this on normal valves, diseased valves, tissue-engineered heart valves. And um, we, we use a lot of cool tools like bioreactors, like ruffles, different biomaterials like the hydrogels, and a lot of tissue engineering strategies as approaches to study valve mechanobiology. So thank you very much. <laughs>